Geraldton. Okay. Thank you, Colin. Terry. So by a show of hands, how many of you are familiar with the Stanford model of uh, chronic disease self-management? Good, quite a few of you, okay. So I'll be sharing just a couple of basics about the program in addition to uh, a couple of my experiences in delivering the chronic disease self-management. And if you'll bear with me, I'm gonna refer to it as the CDSMP just to simplify matters and keep things moving along. Um, I hope to inspire you to want to learn more about the program and how you can help me in building capacity in the Northwest Lynn. So um, what is a CDSMP? Well, it, the process is, of teaching is based on the self-efficacy theory. It incorporates some fundamental strategies which include week weekly action planning and feedback, modeling of behaviors, brainstorming, problem solving by participants for themselves as well as for one another. Each program has roughly between 10 and 15 participants of mixed ages and diagnosis, including a supportive family member if they wish to attend. The program is culturally neutral, is implemented all over the world and within Canada. Some principal assumptions that underlie the CDSMP are that patients with different chronic diseases share similar self-management problems and disease-related tasks. Patients can learn to take responsibility for their day-to-day -day management of their disease, thereby improving their quality of life. Confident, knowledgeable patients practicing self-management will experience improved health status and will utilize fewer health care resources, making our current health care system much more efficient. So evaluation, in, um, that's an important component, was done by Dr. Kate Lorig and her team at Stanford. There was a thousand um, people that participated in a randomized controlled test to this program and they were followed up to a period of three years. Some of the facts I'm sure we're all well aware of. Um, I'm kind of afraid of what these facts will look like by the time I'm a senior if things don't change. I'm a firm believer that we need to adjust our lifestyles and just get back to the basics of eating right and doing things sensibly and in moderation. I'm not sure how we're going to cut health care costs or decrease the incidence of chronic disease if we don't do that. Why is self-management important? Well, for these reasons, as well as the fact that patients self-manage 365 days a year on their own, and they can have a significant impact on their health status and health behaviors, and that can be either a positive impact or a negative impact. So in the CDSMP, participants are given the skills, tools, confidence, necessary to become active self-managers rather than the passive ones. Well, the barrier to any program within this LIN is geography. We all know that. And also, this is where I live in Greenstone. It's uh, roughly about 185 kilometers wide by 75 kilometers. There's approximately 7,500 people that we serve, and it includes the communities of Nikina, Beardmore, Jellico, Longlac, Karamat, and some First Nations, um, Arrowland, Long Lake 58, Ganugaming 77, and Rocky Bay McDermott. So to bring the CDSMP to where I live is um, quite costly because the mileage is tremendous. We have one hospital and that's based in Geraldton. So there's a, there's a big need for people to learn about self-management out there as there is everywhere. So my goal has been and continues to be to train leaders to have them in these communities ideally to have three of them in each one so that costs are minimal and they can run them in their own communities and that makes it easier for the participants. <clears throat> so this is where my story begins. Uh, back in 2008, almost a year ago to the day, I attended the CDSMP master training here in Thunder Bay and while I was there I learned the program had to be facilitated by two certified trainers and there were absolutely no exceptions made by Stanford and I was there alone from my family health team. So that's where I met Anne Wasawa, and she's from Fort Hope, or also known as Yebmatong First Nation. So um, I might use one or the other. I'm more familiar with calling it Fort Hope, but the formal name is Yebmatong. She was in the same predicament. She was there by herself. Um, and throughout the training session, Anne and I kept kind of looking at each other, thinking this could really make a difference in our communities, and we need to figure out a way to do this. So we exchanged contact information. We had no idea how or when we were going to make it work. All we knew is that we were both pretty passionate about using this training um, in, our, in our work. So within the next two months, 
and contacted me to see if I was really serious about going to Fort Hope. Two weeks later, I found myself at this little airport in Nikina and uh, on this plane. Four out of the four morning flights, I was the only passenger on this plane to Fort Hope, so I must admit that I kind of felt like I had my own personal jet without the champagne. Um, and from the beginning, um, Anne and I discovered we were a pretty great team. It had been a natural fit and continues to be a natural fit. Uh, everything just sort of fell into place logistically. Anne took care of the recruitment and the physical facility in Fort Hope and I took care of securing a license to work under and I organized the materials necessary to run the, the program. Um, we quickly determined that our personalities and presentation styles differed greatly and therefore were very complementary. And we agreed if given the choice to handpick a co-facilitator, we probably wouldn't have chosen any better. So the next step was, as always, to seek some financial assistance. Anne had done a, a proposal to um, the NDHN that hadn't come through yet, but we felt that the need to get this program started. So we went to the Dryden Family Health Team and worked under their license. And um, our employers assisted us to get this going and the NDHN funding did finally come through. So some challenges, well I'd never worked with Anne, I had never delivered the program, and I had never been to a fly-in First Nation, I had no idea what I was getting myself into. So I think that my willing spirit is probably what got me through um, to the uncharted territory and uncertainties that uh, I was facing. And I had a lot of questions and fears about being accepted culturally in the community, and that worked out really well. It uh, was quite a rewarding experience. You can see in the background there, that's the community of uh, Fort Hope, and that's not a road, that's the airstrip in the back there. 